In the book of Numbers, from chapter 22 to 25, you can read the account of a king named Balak and a man named Balaam. Balak was the king of a place called Moab, and the Bible says that both he and his people became filled with dread because of the Israelites. By this time, stories about Israel coming up out of Egypt and wandering in the wilderness had spread far and wide. And because the Egyptians and some other nations had sought to harm God's people, they had suffered great disaster. And Balak is afraid that the same thing is going to happen to him and his people. So as he sees the Israelites coming into his territory, he sizes up the situation and he sees that the Israelites are far too numerous to defeat under normal circumstances. And so he turns to Balaam for help. The Bible tells us very little about Balaam's background, but it does tell us that somehow Balak, the king of the Moabites, came to hear that Balaam had the ability to bless people or to curse people. So his plan is to send people to go talk to Balaam, to have Balaam come and curse the Israelites. The king sends a delegation to make the request. Balaam goes that night to inquire of the Lord, and he comes back the next day, and he says, God tells me I can't come because the people of Israel are blessed. Can't go. Well, the delegation goes back to Balak, and of course, Balak doesn't take no for an answer, so he sends another delegation with more pomp and circumstance, and he offers him a huge sum of money to come. Now, quick question. Does Balaam need to ask God again? No. But he does. He asks God, stay here, I'll go talk to God, see what he says. God says, okay, fine, go with them. But God says, only do what I say. So off Balaam goes, riding on his donkey, and we're told that God is angry with Balaam, probably for what's going on in his heart as he's riding his donkey to see Balak. And the angel of the Lord stands in the way, right? If you know your Bibles, you know the story. The angel of the Lord is standing in his way, drawn sword, ready to kill him. Only the donkey sees the angel. And the donkey goes off the path, goes around the angel. Anybody know what Balaam does to the donkey? What does he do? Beats the donkey. (laughs) He doesn't see the angel. Gets back on the path, right? This happens three times. Again, the angel of the Lord stands in the path. The donkey goes off. He beats the donkey. He gets back on the path. And on. Three times this happens. And then God does something amazing. He opens the mouth of the donkey. (laughs) And the donkey says, what have I done to make you beat me these three times? And Balaam says, you have made me a fool. And if I had a sword, I would kill you right now. Now, don't you think the first question should be, how is it that you're talking? (laughs) Don't you think that should be the first question? That's the first question I would ask. I think it's safe to say... If you own a donkey, and your donkey is smarter than you, then you are not having a good day. And then God opens Balaam's eyes, and Balaam sees the angel of the Lord standing in front of him. And the angel says, look, the donkey saved your life. If it wasn't for her, I'd have struck you down. Now, you would think that would make Balaam wise up a little bit, right? You would think that would happen, but it doesn't. When he gets to Balak, he makes three different attempts to curse the Israelites. He tries this and he tries that to get a curse upon the Israelites. But every time he tries, God proclaims a blessing. Now, why does Balaam persist in such foolishness? Well, the book of 2 Peter tells us it's because he loved money and he was willing to persist in trying to get God to change his mind even though God had clearly spoken to Balaam at least five times. You know, that's a trait that is fairly common to human beings. 
When we don't like what God says, we tend to try all sorts of things to change it or to have things work out differently than what God desires. As we've journeyed through the book of 1 Samuel together, that has been a bit of a theme in the life of King Saul. God had made him king. And God says, look, just obey me. But Saul decided to do things differently. And then when God pronounced judgment on him, he refused to accept it. And he fought against God's judgment over his kingship for years. And all of those years of fighting against God lead to the climax here at the end of the book. Here in chapter 28, we find Saul desperately seeking to hear from the Lord. Even though God has already clearly spoken. It's a very sad situation here in chapter 28. It's actually somewhat of a strange situation here in chapter 28, but it's one that we would be wise to learn from. I want to point you to four important lessons from this chapter. The first is this. Crisis can move people to seek the Lord. When people are faced with trouble beyond their control, especially life-threatening situations, they sometimes will turn to God trying to search for answers from Him. Crisis can move people to seek the Lord. Verses 1 through 3 here in chapter 28 set the scene for us. They give us some important background. We're reminded that David, the man whom God has chosen to replace Saul as king, one of Saul's best warriors, we're reminded that he's living in exile among the enemies of Israel, the Philistines. He's living with a man named King Achish. And King Achish believes that now they're going to war against the Philistines, and Achish believes that David is going to fight for his side. I think we're given a little hint in verse 2 when David says, yeah, you're going to see for yourself what your servant can do. I think that's a little hint David's not going to be fighting for the Philistines, but in fact, he'll be fighting for the Israelites. But even so, Saul is certainly not going to be counting on David for his help because he's the one that has driven David out of the land in the first place. Verse 3 also reminds us that Samuel, the person whom this book is named after, the prophet of the Lord who was tested and proved to speak God's word over the course of many decades, we learn that he has died. So even if Saul wanted to, he couldn't go and seek Samuel's help. It also says in verse 3, this is an important note. Look there in verse 3. It says that Saul had expelled the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Uh, the, prob the more literal translation of that would be necromancers. It's basically people who talk to dead people. And Saul had kicked them all out of the land. Now this is almost like a footnote in verse 3, but it's important because that was a good thing for Saul to do. That was in accordance with the written word of God. You can read about it in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and also Leviticus 19. It was good for Saul to kick the mediums and the spiritists, the necromancers out of the land. Now with all those things in mind, we read this in verses 4 through 6. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunem, while Saul gathered all the Israelites and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul, saw that the, when Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer by dreams or Urim or prophets. Now, this is a scene that Saul has witnessed many times as king. I mean, if you, read, if you learn anything about uh, reading the book of 1 Samuel, you learn that the Philistines and the Israelites, they were always fighting. They were always going to war. So this is sort of a normal thing. But in this occasion, when the army gathers, Saul is terrified. It could be his age. By this time, he's about 72 years old. Uh, how many 70-year-olds in the room want to saddle up and go into battle? Anybody? Could be he's just, you know, 
getting a little long in the tooth, and so he's afraid about what's going to happen. I mean, how many times had he ridden into battle over those 40 years that he had reigned over Israel? All the time. But this time he's afraid. Could be his age. Could be the numbers. Could be that the Philistines gather more men than they usually do, and so the numbers are very intimidating and he's afraid. The Bible really doesn't tell us why he's afraid. It just says that he is afraid. He's a man who's desperate. He's a man in crisis. And what does he do? He tries to seek the Lord. He tries to hear from God. He looks to the Lord in dreams. He tries the Urim, which is an implement that was kept in the garment of the high priest that was used to determine the will of the Lord. That's totally biblical and sanctioned in the law of Moses. He inquires of prophets. There were more prophets in the land than just Samuel, although he was the highest prophet. But that doesn't work. Nothing he tries works. He tries all the usual means at his disposal to hear from the Lord. That's what being in crisis can do for many people. They will turn to the Lord looking for help. Saul's not slacking here. He's earnestly trying to hear from the Lord because he's in crisis. You've probably heard the saying, there are no atheists in a foxhole. Anybody ever hear that saying before? A foxhole is a military term for a place to take cover when a soldier is under enemy fire. And more often than not, when bullets are passing by a soldier and their life is hanging by a thread, they cry out, sometimes even out loud, sometimes just in their heart, but out loud loud sometimes, what will they say? God, help me please. People do that in those sorts of circumstances. Before that, when there was no danger, he might not have given God a second thought, but when faced with the life-threatening situation, he cries out. That's true of much more than just situations of warfare. When people face impossible financial situations, they might seek after God. If your marriage is at a breaking point, you might turn to the Lord. You might have a health scare that might cause you to seek God's face. A wayward child or grandchild might cause you to seek after God, and the list could go on and on and on. There is something about being in a crisis that is beyond human control that has a tendency to push people towards God. I wish I could say that those types of situations bring many people to God in a real and lasting way. To be sure, that does happen on occasion, but it's also a common thing for people to put God back up on the shelf or push them to the sidelines when the crisis is over. It's also a common thing for people to become embittered towards God or doubt that He's real if things don't work out the way that you want them to or you feel like God is ignoring you. Never forget one time having a lunch with a guy who was going through a difficult time and we were talking about faith and I asked him, do you believe in God? And he says, yes, I believe in God. I just don't think He cares. It was heartbreaking. I wish I could say that crisis drove people to a real and lasting relationship all the time, but it doesn't always happen. And here, Saul is seeking after God, and he keeps running into a brick wall, getting nowhere. It says that the Lord didn't say anything to him. Why? Why doesn't he get to hear from the Lord? I think most of us can likely relate to that, which is why we need this second lesson from our text this morning. It's this, God will seem silent if we don't listen to what He's already said. If we are dissatisfied with what God has clearly revealed, then pining away for him to say something else will not help us understand who he is, and it will not help us desire anything better at all. God will seem silent if we don't listen to what he has already said. Now think back to verse 3, that little side note 
of Saul having expelled all the spiritists or mediums from the land. Remember, that was the right thing to do. That was based on what God had clearly said in His written Word through His servant Moses. As king, it's an important thing to know about the kings of Israel. They were required, if you were going to be king of Israel, you had to write out by hand your own copy of God's law, of God's Word. Where did Saul get the idea to kick these people out of the land? He got it from the Word of God, and he was right to do so. All of that was good. You know, though Saul had many faults, he did do some good and godly things at times. Unfortunately, he had also failed to obey God's clear command through Samuel. And because of that... Because God had clearly spoken through Samuel and Saul did not listen, Saul loses the kingship to another person. And by this time, Saul knows who that person is. It's David who's going to replace him. So if we ask the question, why is God silent when Saul seeks him in the crisis? The answer is because the Lord has already spoken and Saul has refused to listen. Because of that, He's willing to go even further and break God's word again. Listen to verse 7 through 11. This is his response to not hearing from the Lord. Saul then said to his attendants, Find me a woman who is a medium so that I may go and inquire of her. There's one in Endor, they said. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. But the woman said to him, surely you know what Saul has done. He is cut off. That can either mean kick out or put to death, probably put to death. He's cut off the mediums and spirits, spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Then the woman asked, whom shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. So God's word here makes it really, really clear that Saul knew better. He made the law based on God's law. Now he's going back on what was right because he's in a tough situation. Even worse, he swears an oath here in God's name, saying that he will protect the woman from any consequences for doing what God has forbidden. You see how upside down this is? He's clearly desperate to hear from God, but he doesn't really want to hear what the Lord has to say. It would seem that he's not, that he is that he is not willing to listen to what God has to say because he's going against what God has already said. You know, this is sort of like cooking a meal for someone you know or love. You ever done that? Anybody ever cook a meal for someone you know or love? Tons of starving people in the room this morning. Well, if you've done that, good for you. Now imagine you're cooking a meal for somebody who's close to you, somebody you love, and you cook a meal that you know they hate. Let's just say the person you love, they hate fish, they hate coleslaw, and they hate broccoli. I love all three of those things. But let's say somebody hated all three of those things, and that's what you made them for supper. Now they're hungry, and they need sustenance, so they choke it down because they want to survive another day. And the meal's over, they're done eating, and you ask them, how was it? (laughs) Are you really interested in that answer? How many times has this person told you over the years, I hate fish, I hate coleslaw, I hate broccoli? Do they really need to say it to you again? While most of us would never do that to other people, particularly people we love, it's very easy to end up doing that with the Lord. We live in a time, this is amazing, 
for all the problems of the times we live in. We live in an amazing time. We live in a time where we have the complete written word of the living God. It bears the marks. This book bears the marks of divine inspiration. It is the only book. These 66 books is is the only book that our risen Lord Jesus bore witness to as Holy Scripture. It's been miraculously preserved for you and I over the course of two millennia. It's been translated accurately into our own language, mercifully by the work of God, the Holy Spirit. And yet many who call themselves Christians leave it on the shelf. Many so-called pastors and theologians dismiss it in favor of their own ideology or thinking or worldview. Many look to the wisdom of culture or their own experience instead of the written word of God. You may say, I feel like God is distant and silent in my life. People say that from time to time. If that's you, I want to ask a question. It's a tough one. Do you really want to hear what he has to say? And the level of affection you have for his written word will tell you the answer to that question. And if you don't have any affection for what God has already said, then it should be of no surprise to you that you feel like you're not hearing from Him. I don't mean hearing an audible voice. I mean hearing from Him in His written Word. That brings up a third lesson this morning. Here's the lesson. Spirituality contrary to God's Word cannot change God's Word. The true and living God who reigns over all creation cannot be manipulated by any superstition, not by any ceremony that originates from the idolatry of the human heart. Spirituality, contrary to God's Word, cannot change God's Word. Now, A great deal of ink, it's important to say, a great deal of ink has been spilt over these next few verses. And generally speaking, the big question that people wrestle with in these verses is, is it really Samuel who comes up and speaks to Saul? Theologians and Christians have been arguing about this one for a very long time. There's basically two camps of people. There's the camp of people who say, yes, it is Samuel. And there's a camp of people who say, no, it's not really Samuel. It's a demon that impersonates Samuel. Because how can the spiritual practices of the devil command the presence of the prophet of God? And so that's basically the two camps. Now, I empathize with that perspective. How can practices of the devil have power over a prophet of God? I empathize with that perspective position, but it seems to go against the plain reading of the text. Just look in verse 15 for a moment. I'm just going to jump to a few verses. It says, Samuel said. In verse 16, it says the same. And in verse 20, it says, Samuel's words. Now, if that were simply Saul talking, or if it were simply the witch of Endor speaking, then I would say that it's still possible that Samuel could be impersonated. But this is the narration portion of the text. So this is the word of God saying that Samuel said. That's sort of tough to get around. It would seem that the plain reading would be that this is actually Samuel who comes up and speaks to Saul. Now, how do we deal with the problem of the power of the devil, evil spirituality, having power over the soul of a dead prophet? Like, that is a problem, I admit. It seems to me that the only way to square that is to remember what we talked about over the last couple weeks, which is that the Lord has ultimate power over everything, including sorcery and witchcraft. So God has the ability to permit and restrict absolutely everything in the entire universe, including evil. So... It seems, it would seem that God permits this event to take place so that Samuel would speak to Saul. 
That seems to be consistent with what the woman, the woman's reaction is in verse 12. Look at verse 12. When the woman saw Samuel, again, the narration portion of the text, she cried out at the top of her voice and said, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. Now, why does she cry out in fear? Is it only because she's afraid of Saul's edict and she thinks that she's going to be put to death? Or is it she has seen Samuel and she's being confronted with the power of God in this situation? I believe it's probably a combination of both, but I think it's probably more the former than the latter. I think she's, being, she's filled with terror because she's being confronted with the power of God. And I believe the reason the Lord does this is to highlight Saul's turning away from him. His pattern of disobeying what God has already said. This is like ultimate salt in the wound for a man who refuses to listen to God. Now let's hear what Samuel says to the king. Verses 15 through 19. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I'm in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me and God has turned away from me. He no longer answers me either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, Why do you consult me now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. He has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also hand over the army of Israel to the Philistines. When the Lord seemed silent to Saul... He turned to wicked means to hear from Samuel. Now here's a critical question about the verses we just read. Does Samuel say anything new to Saul? The only thing new that Samuel says to Saul here is that he's going to die the next day and the army is going to be defeated. But even that is not really new. It's simply the fulfilling of what God had already said before. So even though Saul had gone down this road in desperation, this path of evil, hoping to find a way out, what he discovers is that God will do what he has said. And no sorcery or witchcraft is going to change it. How many people have ever read or seen in a movie or a TV show something called a genie? A genie is an imaginary being that usually lives in a bottle or a lamp, right? Somebody finds the bottle or the lamp and they come and they rub the bottle or the lamp and the genie comes out and the genie grants the person three wishes usually, right? Which means that the genie is then bound to do whatever the person who rubbed the lamp says. Now we know that's not real. Those are imaginary. There's no such thing as genies in bottles, but I wonder how many people treat God like that. Not too long ago, there was an old idea that resurfaced that gained a lot of proper popularity. It was called a prayer circle. And they said, what you do is you take a stick and you draw a circle in the ground and then you stand inside the circle and whatever you pray for inside that circle, God is obligated to do. That's not a biblical idea. That's a pagan idea. God is not bound by ceremony or ritual. I don't care how many candles you light or whatever beads you hold in your hand or whatever ceremony you go through. God is not bound by those things. What God is bound by is His own will. And he responds to his people in accordance with his will. You can try and change the Bible. 
You can try and twist it to suit your own ideas, to be in more in keeping with the times. You can try and say that you believe this part and not that part. But no matter what you do, the reality is that God has spoken and His Word will not change. Saul's life could have been completely different. It's true, his disobedience cost him the throne, cost him the kingship. But what if he had humbly accepted that? What if he had embraced David and celebrated him as the new king instead of trying to kill him? What if he had truly humbled himself before the Lord and sought forgiveness through repentance and faith? It's true, he would have lost the throne but he would have gained restored fellowship with God, which is far better. The same thing is true for us. God has made a way for us to be right with Him through Jesus Christ. Because Jesus has died in the place of our sins, we can be forgiven. And through repentance and faith in His life, death, and resurrection, we can be made right with God. Because our debt is truly paid through Christ, God can restore us without compromising one sentence in His Word. Not one jot or tittle needs to pass away from the Word of God. He doesn't compromise His Word. He doesn't compromise His holiness in the least degree to make us right with Him through Jesus. And that, brothers and sisters, is good news. It's good for all who believe. But as these last few verses show us in this text, refusing to act according to what God says takes people to a bad place. And that's the fourth lesson of our text. It's this, failing to obey when God speaks leads to fear and hopelessness. When a person finally realizes that they will not have their way before the Lord, and yet they still cling to their sinful desires, it will bring them to a place of deep despair. Failing to obey when God speaks leads to fear and hopelessness. Saul has managed to hang on to power. He's managed to hang on to the throne for a number of years, but now he's at the end of the road. And tomorrow he's going to be dead. He had many opportunities in his 40 plus years on the throne to turn from his pride and to humble himself, but instead he persists in resisting the word of the Lord. And that leads to this in verses 20 through 25. Immediately, having heard what Samuel said, immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all day and night. When the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, she said, Look, your maidservant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. Now please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so you may eat and have strength to go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his men joined the woman in urging him, and he listened to them. He got up from the ground and sat on the couch. The woman had a fattened calf at the house, which she butchered at once. She took some flour, kneaded it, and baked bread without yeast. Then she set it before Saul and his men, and they ate. That same night, they got up and left. He's filled with fear. Why? Why is he filled with fear? Well, It says right here, he's filled with fear because of Samuel's words. He knows in this moment that Samuel is right, and he's coming face to face with the consequences. And the fact is, that is a moment that every single person, listen to this carefully, every single person who rejects the Lord... Everyone who rejects Jesus Christ as their Savior will face a moment like this. The Bible says that everyone who's ever lived will stand before God's throne. In that moment, there will be no doubt. There will be no debate. There will be no arguing. There will simply be justice. Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
And that is absolutely true. But I fear some of you don't believe it. If you did, if you truly believe that, you would cling by faith alone to Jesus so that He would plead before the Father on your behalf so that you would be adopted as, his, as a child of God for Christ's sake. Without Him, there is only condemnation and judgment. And that's what happens here with Saul. He's going to be dead the next day. He's filled with fear. He's lost all his strength. He's hopeless. It is a sad, heartbreaking scene. Here is a man who is a full foot or so taller than anyone else in the land. Big and tall and strong. And here he is, face down on the ground, zapped of strength both physically and spiritually. And his only solace is a meal from a godless woman so that he might have enough energy to drag himself to a hopeless battle and die. That's a real tragedy. It is super sad. And it all happens because he did not listen to what the Lord had said. Think back over the course of your life. Can you think of a time when you have said to yourself, I wish I would have listened. Maybe it was something that your mom said to you. Maybe it was something your dad said to you. Maybe it was a friend, a teacher, a spouse, a doctor, or someone else. Someone who gave you good advice and you didn't take it and you had to endure the consequences because you didn't listen. You know what the words I wish I would have listened mean? It means you have regret. It means there's sorrow in your life. No doubt all of us have regrets in life. No one here this morning, not you, not me, not anyone, is perfect. In fact, we're all far from it. But don't let refusing to listen to what God has said be a continuing regret in your life. Don't let a time of crisis be the only time when you seek after the Lord. Don't put your hands over your ears and then wonder why God seems silent. Don't think that you can make God bow to your will. You cannot. And don't end up in fear and hopelessness. The Lord has spoken. You can hear from God every single day. He has spoken. And the exhortation from this sad end to this king's life is this. Listen to what God has said and live. Let's pray. Oh Lord, I, I think in the pridefulness of my heart, I, I have a desire to look down on Saul and the foolishness of the course that he chose for his life. But Lord, as I, as I think about him, especially in this chapter, I'm filled with sorrow and empathy for the man, and I know the same kind of weakness is present in me. Oh, how great is your mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh God, if not for your grace, we would all be lost. But you hold out your hand day after day and you say, come, be forgiven and restored. Hear my voice and follow me. Oh God, I pray that you'd give us ears to hear and hearts to obey. In Jesus' name. Amen.